I wanted to be... Uh, oh. Oh. <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning. Please do make yourself comfortable. There's plenty of seats to my left, if you can't see one uh, immediately close by. Welcome to this session. It's my privilege and pleasure to moderate it. I look forward to that immensely. My name is Graham Hutchings. I'm Managing Director of Oxford Analytica, the global analysis and advisory company. And we have uh, an extraordinary topic to consider this morning. Extraordinary in its breadth, in its range, and in its importance. It's a rather formidable task that we face, but a welcome one because the subject is so important. Working title, as you can see, is limited internet privacy. What are the effects on democracy and development? In our favor, alongside the importance and the intrinsic interest of this topic, we have an excellent panel to help us unfold some of the key issues, unearth some of the key issues uh, at stake from different perspectives, from different geographical jurisdictions. And we have you, both you who I see physically in front of me and those who are coming in even as we speak, plus those in the wider world about which more in a moment. But let me begin by introducing the panel. I'm going to do so in terms of just brief affiliation and names, and I'm going to ask them to speak briefly as well before we have a wider conversation. So in the order in which they will make some opening remarks, let me on your behalf welcome Guy Berger, Director of the Division of Freedom, Expression and Media Development at UNESCO. Renata Avia Pinto from the Web We Want Initiative. She's Global Campaign Manager of the Web Foundation Guatemala. Walid al Sakaf is lecturer at Oribro University here in Sweden. And you may well imagine he's going to speak uh, about the Arab world in general, just as Renata is going to address some Global South issues doubtless from a Central and Latin American perspective. Uh, we have Agnes Calamar, who is Director of Global Freedom of Expression and the Information Initiative at Columbia University, and she's going to address some of the overarching international global norms that are relevant to our discussion. And finally, sitting closest to me, is Pirongrong Ramasuta, who is Director of the Thai Media Policy Center the Department of Journalism and Information at the Faculty of Communication uh, Arts in Chulalongkorn University. And uh, you uh, will uh, appreciate that the issue of democracy is very much on her mind and <laughs> those of her country persons, given the dramatic developments over the last week or so in Bangkok. So that's who we are here in this room. Uh, we have a hashtag SIF14B um, number for you to liaise with us, so please use that. And we have two digital curators, Isabel and Christian, they're on my right there. Uh, they will be sharing with us um, the outside world's view and input into this conversation. That's the topic, that's who we are. We want to make this as interactive as possible. So some shortish remarks from the panel, please. And those of you here in the audience, physically and digitally, please be prepared to contradict, to contend, to contribute, because we all learn that way and we want to use the intellectual capital that we see before us, as well as that seated on the sofa and to chairs as well. Mm -hmm. So, let's get going. Guy, you've kindly consented to get us off to a start. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everybody. So, I'm from UNESCO, uh, which is not only dealing with cultural heritage, but also with freedom of expression. When I looked at this topic, it said limited privacy, and then the effects on democracy and development, and how to reduce vulnerabilities. Yep. So I'll make a few comments on those. So whose privacy? 
and then the democracy and development. So privacy, which we haven't really discussed about here, also involves uh, corporate privacy. And there's a whole debate about corporate espionage, as people know, and clearly this has a huge impact on development questions. But that's really something that's kind of done by the World Trade Organization, and you know, th that, that fits into their shop, uh, World Intellectual Property Organization, not really UNESCO, so I'm not going to speak about that. But I think that the question of development and internet issues is really important. Not only democracy, but also development. There is a debate in the UN to develop the post-millennium development goals for the next uh, 15 years, but it's not really recognizing the importance of a free internet and, uh, uh, um, and of uh, freedom of expression in development. Let me come to the particular question, though, of reducing the vulnerabilities, and particularly I'd like to focus on the question of what, is, what happens at the UN level and where I think this fits into the total ecology uh, can be explained by means of a metaphor. So, in terms of health, everyone agrees that each individual can protect themselves by keeping their hands clean. So, there's an individual level of protection. Uh, you know, so, you can protect your privacy as an individual to a certain extent. Then, of course, you have an institutional level. So, it doesn't help you to be washing your hands in the kitchen has got uh, bacteria in it because the food you're going to be served is... So there's an institutional level of protection of privacy, particularly for the media, uh, to protect its journalists uh, and their privacy. And then you have the kind of broad normative level, and I suppose you could say the World Health Organization, which tries to set some standards, you know, encourages these, these things. So where I'm working is at the broad normative level at, at UNESCO. And interestingly, um, at UNESCO, a statement was made last year by all the member states, 195 governments agreed on this statement, and i read this to you. They said, journalists must be able to rely on privacy, security, and anonymity in their communications. Oh, I'm sorry, I messed up, I read you the wrong quote. <laughs> that's, that's Frank LaRue I'm going to come to. Sorry, let me just finish Frank LaRue. Frank LaRue, who, as you know, is a UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression, he said, journalists must be able to rely on privacy, security, and anonymity. Those are three quite important characteristics of communications. He says, an environment where surveillance is widespread and unlimited by due process or judicial oversight cannot sustain the presumption of protection of sources. Okay. It's mm. quite a strong statement coming from Frank Leroux. Now, the UNESCO statement, which they agreed, the 195 uh, states last November, they said, privacy is essential to protect journalistic sources, which enable a society to benefit from investigative journalism, to strengthen good governance and the rule of law, and this privacy should not be subject to arbitrary or unlawful interference. 195 countries signed up. Signed up to that statement. Of course, immediately raises the question, which countries declined so to do? Do you know offhand? Oh, no, no, it's unanimous in, in the UNESCO. Right. Uh, 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 you know, it's 195 countries. They all agreed on that statement. Yep. Uh, Frank LaRue speaks uh, as an independent rapporteur. But you have two quite strong statements here yep. about what is needed to reduce the vulnerability of journalist sources and why because the impact is on society of investigative journalism, as spelled out by the UNESCO member states. So I think that's quite an important thing that, that has come out. Now, let me just add a little bit more over here, because it goes a bit further. Um, how, uh, how, how, how should this thing be, be, be implemented? According to Frank LaRue, he says that in order to have this kind of protection at the global uh, normative level, the kind of standards for digital uh, protection, there must be safeguards in law for the nature of surveillance, the scope of surveillance, the duration of surveillance. That's, again, quite detailed standards. Yep. It says the grounds for surveillance, who can authorize, carry out, and supervise, and what remedy is provided. So you've got actually you know, not just wash your hands, how, to, how you could wash them, you know, the yeah. kind of different, you know, make sure you, 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 know, you do but this. The, the point is that would find its expression in the terms of nationally approved legislation. Would it well, be embodied in that format or would it exist in some sort of ether as a set of principles to which okay. people would willingly sign up or re resentfully sign up, as the case may be? Right. 
Well, let me give you an exact answer on that. In November, December last year, the General Assembly agreed on a resolution that called on governments to review their surveillance practices yep. and in implement independent oversight mechanisms. Okay? okay? Part of that review could certainly be this thing about how do you protect the sources of journalists, which is so important for investigative journalism. Now, I'll just make my last comment very yep. quickly here, because somebody said this, and I'll ask the audience, who do you think said this? I'm concerned that surveillance programs are becoming too aggressive. I understand that security and criminal activity may justify some exceptional and narrowly tailored use of surveillance, but that is all the more reason to safeguard human rights and fundamental freedoms. Who do you think said that? Well, the Guy Berger Prize for getting this correct is lunch on him afterwards, so there's a <coughs> high stakes. Sure. Yeah, he he could cheat, but, but is, is Perret here? Perret, who said that? No. Nope. Who? No, it was not Madame Pillay, the, the, the Human Rights Commission. That was Ban Ki-moon. Renata knows. Huh? It was Ban Ki-moon <laughs> who said that. What Ban Ki-moon said, I'm concerned that surveillance programs are becoming too aggressive. I understand it may be justified, narrow, exceptionally, etc., etc. But it's very important to safeguard this. He, he knew because I spoke at his university recently and I, okay. I said this. So from Ban Ki-moon, the highest level saying this kind of thing. But this is my last point. What Ban Ki-moon also said in his statement, he says... All countries have committed to protecting individual freedoms on paper, but in practice, too many break their pledge. Yes, understood. Well, thank you for setting out that um, encouraging scenario and also for that note of realism that um, you appended at the end, because that's very important, because I think that's where Renata probably wants to go in well, her... I, I love the connection. I mean, you, you gave me like the great greatest opportunity mm -hmm. now to discuss something, that <laughs> to have a very uncomfortable talk here. And the, the very uncomfortable talk that we have here, like I know that uh, you usually link development with uh, poor countries and the global south. But um, the problem that we have here with uh, the erosion of privacy and surveillance is of concern of all of us, and mostly the so-called developed countries, because the so-called developed countries are the most, the, the most like a backwards, the most like a, like a, the countries where this problem is right there and is, is really, really, really harm, harming them and harming other citizens abroad. Concrete example, even the United Nations, as disclosed by, by WikiLeaks on cables uh, released in 2010, even Navi Pillai and many of her officers, and maybe you, and maybe many, many, many others, including uh, UNESCO, including UNICEF, including other agencies like uh, which um, collect and uh, had the duty to protect uh, very sensitive data were, were under targeted surveillance by uh, intelligence agencies of a set of five countries. Um, countries which uh, are like so-called um, champions on human rights, but, seems, uh, that, but uh, they are failing to respect even the highest authorities of human rights. Which is very damaging. Which is, is very damaging because it, 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 it has two effects. The effect that it has uh, globally is, uh, um, it, it is this, um, you know, information is power. If you control all the information of everyone, you are practically controlling, you have the capacity and the possibility to control and influence the politics and the economy of the whole planet. Yep. And, and um, the sacrificing the, you are not just sacrificing the privacy of some citizens, you are sacrificing much more because uh, by leaving the internet vulnerable, by leaving the internet and the hardware and the software uh, that we use, like uh, full of holes, security holes, you are exposing people like the Syrian refugees who go to the United Nations and to, who register their data. You risk um, opposition parties in a country that, or may, maybe the, the, the corrupt authority is friend of certain country and will have full access to this, this information. You, you leave, um, you break the possibility of change, uh, you crush the, the possibility of change in countries where uh, freedom of assembly will not be possible because they will be so monitored and that information will be facilitated uh, that, uh, that you could not even organize a protest to tackle the government. And it goes beyond that. It goes beyond that because uh, these um, 
power that some country exercise in the rest of us uh, has led to a, a clear examples of economic espionage, concrete examples that we have uh, learned thanks to uh, Edward Snowden, who sadly is not here even, even uh, by, a, by a stream, but who will cool, cool tell us more. For example, the unfair advantages on spying in the uh, mining ministry in Brazil. Yep. When spying on a Mexican uh, petroleum company. The charge um, sheet is quite long. Excuse me? The charge sheet is quite long, and the, um, the problems this has created is immense. What and, are and the solutions? How do we move into a sort of resolution and well, rescue phase? I, I see it as a problem. Uh, you know, uh, it's very interesting that you use the example of washing the hands, because I see surveillance as pollution. Uh, pollution, uh, we, uh, we have polluted uh, the world with these technologies, and uh, uh, the solution will not be only on a, a group of governments. It involves companies. It involves companies making huge profit out of this, and, and it, it, it involves um, uh, actually citizens. Citizen, citizens, uh, as Edward Snowden, working on this in total secret and, and, and uh, being, uh, and not, not only uh, in these uh, Five Eye countries, but in so many countries, citizens allowing this happening, like uh, workers allowing this happening, uh, factories uh, designing computers like this that allow, um, easily allow, uh, with backdoors that easily allow uh, everyone to spy on them. And, and if, if we don't, uh, we, now I think that we need to, to, to take a similar approach of the environmentalist uh, campaigners. Like, okay, look at the problem. Yes, it's a little bit exotic, but it's damaging everyone and right. everything. And start a process of cleaning our spaces from these technologies, mm. starting uh, from us, I will say. Starting from our uh, it's a very choices. It's a very powerful phrase, cleaning our spaces of technology. I'm just wondering how we could move into a concrete manifestation of that. What would it mean for us as citizens to clean our mm -hmm. space of technology? Well, you can move to open and free technologies that, uh, that uh, yep. make very difficult to have these backdoors and to have these systems. And that's quite uh, an easy systems. thing to do, isn't it? One step, speaking. very easy step to do, and uh, the first ones to adopt that should be governments, because Currently, we have uh, most of the governments running uh, backdoor software. Okay. So that's affecting the, the that make, making them vulnerable at all levels. For example. All right. Okay. Let's just stay with that phrase because it, that Renata used. It is it is a very striking one. Cleaning our space of technology. And and let, let me just invite any questions on that particular topic. Is there something that could be done significantly in terms of numbers, in terms of a critical mass of governments or corporations that would allow this to happen? Or do we think the vested interests are at the moment so formidable that it would be better to focus on a, a different dimension of the issues that we're facing? I uh, invite um, anybody to uh, volunteer to clean up their technological space. The gentleman over here. Hello, my name is Wojciech Horliński. I'm a journalist from Poland, and I, I like very much the, 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 the ecological uh, metaphor because we have seen a similar situation 50 years ago in, in Europe and elsewhere when, uh, when, when after World War II, the, the, the industrial growth was seen as some necessity, as, and, and everybody who would say anything against, but perhaps this factor will pollute uh, our air, would be seen as the enemy of progress, somebody who doesn't want to create new jobs, and so on. And 50 years later, we just treat it as something absolutely obvious that well build this factory god help you good luck but 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 you you will have to apply to this regulation this regulation this regulation so on and this is my only hope for the future that perhaps uh, eu level un level and so on regulations on information technology and data processing will look will look similar because one thing which is very important is that an individual cannot solve this problem individually one company cannot solve this problem on the level of one company just like uh, just like it is with the environment you can uh, segregate your, your garbage al alone, but if you do it alone and your neighbors won't do it, it's, it's pointless. You cannot protect clean air. You have a game theory problem, in other yeah. words. Everybody, it, Collective it action problem. Every, everybody or nobody, but individual is, is, is helpless. So I think... Anybody else on this uh, particular topic? Uh, the lady here, just, just standing up. 
Yeah, it has to do with cleaning our environment as, as an organization also. Um, I think the theme is also not to monopolize technologies. And I think that open source is a possibility for all of us to not uh, depend on one, you know, one source, one company, one, one kind of media. Yep. So I think that uh, in that perspective, for example, in Central America, we have the issue of uh, international organizations that in solidarity fund projects, but all their formats are in a monopolized way uh, using you know, one system, so we have to adapt to that. Hmm. And that shouldn't be just, because a no contract of a project says we have to use a private system. So I think that also has to do with changes that in the developing and developed world we have to uh, make. And okay. that's a political Good. decision too. Renata, would you like to respond to anything you've yeah. heard before we move on? Uh, yes, I would like to respond uh, with a very concrete um, uh, call for attention for all the Swedish citizens here. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have a serious problem here. And it's very interesting to see a, a, a country as developed as Sweden in a similar position as a developing country in terms of privacy when you allow massive surveillance. And so it's just a call of attention that it, it is something that, uh, is something that uh, we are in a very bad position and, and de developed countries with well-educated citizens should see this and shouldn't let that happen assuming that everything will be fine always. So uh, power changes, you know, wealth moves like this, and the situation might change, and you might uh, come into a point that you have a very abusive uh, president or, or, or a parliament abusing your rights, and if you open the door of massive surveillance and total control of your communications and your relationships, I think that um, uh, okay. it's something that we can work together, the so-called poor developing world and the and then uh, Global North with their fast internet and sophisticated devices. Very good, Renata. Thank you very much. The focus, of course, is very much on democracy here in various parts of the world and the role the internet plays in facilitating that. We won't get too much into definitions of democracy. I think we all have a working idea of what it broadly means. It would be um, uh, to hijack this session if we were to get into the constitutional complexities of it. Uh, we're talking, broadly speaking, are we not, about a great enlargement in the sphere of individual freedom as a kind of uh, a necessary, if not sufficient, condition for democracy. But let's, um, let's turn to you, Walid, and, and, and think particularly about the Arab world. Let's think about the internet and democracy there. We have seen since 2010 this most extraordinary uh, development across a whole range of jurisdictions, firstly in North Africa, and then spreading up through uh, the Levant, hovering around the Gulf a little bit, um, of uh, an explosion of anger, of demand for change, and we've seen quite a strong reaction in various uh, quarters uh, to that. So we haven't come back to zero. Something has happened. It's very substantial. Share a few thoughts with us on uh, uh, the, the internet and digital dimensions of that. Yes, uh, certainly, Graham. Uh, but uh, before I go into the details, let me just describe, uh, for me, simplicity is works best. Yes. And, and to simplify things, because I come actually from uh, a journalism background, though my academic training is uh, computer science. And, mm. uh, journalists tend to simplify to deliver a message, Okay, mm. perhaps the truth, if not the facts. And then there's also the academic side. And I'm also uh, an academic at Arab University, as I mentioned here. Apparently, students understand best when things are simple. And I'd like to simplify by demonstrating a, a personal story. Very a story good. of my own, a story of my father, mm. uh, a story of struggle. Um, in 1999, my father had uh, uh, unfortunately left home and never came back. Uh, he was an editor-in-chief of Yemen Times, the, the Yemeni newspaper, promoting democracy, <laughs> open debate, um, issues related to development. He never came back, and it was uh, uh, an unfortunate what had been framed as, let's say, an accident, uh, later never investigated. Mm. But the very fact that he was able, I mean, he had the courage to speak out and mm. demonstrate to the world that we as Yemenis uh, have the right to be free and democratic had led to his uh, loss of his life. 
Mm. Learning from that, I remember I also took over the newspaper then uh, since uh, from to 1999 to 2005. I was uh, once walking across the street and someone told me, hey, remember your father, <laughs> be careful. So it, it was uh, a demonstration, not, and it's obviously uh, an analogy here, but the very fact that what led to his death was his openness, his a brave attitude in writing critically against the state hmm. made people aware, being aware that perhaps not revealing my identity hmm. is a better option. If I were to begin to affect influence without risking too much of my, hmm. uh, in my life. And where the internet comes is precisely there. The very fact that the internet has an infrastructure, or let's say a, sen a decentralized uh, structure that allows anonymity makes people m more aware of the potential to speak out freely. Mm. And I uh, applaud projects l such as the Tor project, which allows you to uh, remain anonymous online while being critical and open and, and uh, presenting your opinions. But as we have seen, right now there is a mass surveillance, uh, let's say, attack taking place. And yesterday uh, we had um, an unconference session uh, on, on this, and Andrew Lumen of the Tor Project said, we are beginning to lose the battle. Here is where I'd like to chime in. We, as in the Arab world, have seen the internet help us. We have seen that activists through blog, uh, blogs, Facebook, Twitter, and other forms of um, new media could convey a strong message. They could actually point out scandals. They could uh, very directly point to very uh, grave violations. Yeah. However, with the introduction of surveillance, now the game is changing. And perhaps Arab regimes were quite naive, less developed in the, than the West in terms of deploying these surveillance techniques, yet increasingly we see software companies from the West deploying or selling devices to those regimes. So we are seeing that the, if, in order to begin changing, let's say avoiding a potentially disastrous fate in the Arab world for cyber activists, perhaps looking into the other side of the, <laughs> of the uh, equation, let's say across the Atlantic, if it's the US or Northern Europe or Germany, this is where we need to focus most. If we were to start stopping the uh, companies from selling these uh, seriously damaging uh, software and equipment. So I find my role here as to mm. remind the world that even though we have the courage, the ambition, we are not ready to lose more lives. I mean, we have lost so many in the Arab Spring. And we have seen that governments are willing to invest so much money and wealth and, and, and have resources to, do, to even uh, recruit hackers, as such as they've done in Morocco, or even uh, utilize face recognition, as they've done in Bahrain, to pinpoint and identify activists. So, it is very crucial to see this as a global phenomenon affecting people that are vulnerable. So that's one point that I'd like to raise. That's a, a very good point too. Uh, do we have anybody else who, as it were, speaks with experience or is in one more sense or another representative from uh, the uh, Arab world uh, where there's been these extraordinary developments? It would be uh, nice to hear from ma'am. My name is Rasha Abdul. I'm a professor of mass communication at the American University in Cairo. Hmm. Uh, well, this is my area of expertise, so I, call, I could tell you anything if you uh, ask me a question <laughs> or I could just speak for hours. <laughs> but uh, I just uh, raise uh, my hand in, in answer uh, to is there anything. If you want to respond in any way to what Walid has said, beginning with his obviously very personal story, but other observations about this issue of the internet and democracy, a huge issue, but are there one or two little strands you'd tease out for us to to think about here, and maybe they have applicability to other jurisdictions. Uh, yes, I totally agree with, uh, with what uh, Walid has said. We at least have a, a right to be uh, uh, private online and to be anonymous if needed, if you need to. Uh, Egypt was one of the first Arab countries to, um, for bloggers to emerge yes. uh, out of the Arab world, and certainly in terms of numbers, because you know we have the biggest population by far right. in the Arab world. Uh, but still, and most of our bloggers choose to blog uh, with their names, uh, with their published names. But we, we have a few who uh, have remained anonymous uh, over the years. 
Uh, we have a couple who have sort of uh, come out after the revolution uh, because they felt that that was a safe point for them to come out. Um, but it's very true that uh, the way the Egyptian government has been doing it is basically targeting online activists offline. So basically, online right. activists are targeted, and then once they're on the streets, because you know there's no such thing as an online activist who remains behind the keyboard, right? They're it's, they're people. They're who, real people, and they course, do they yeah. go shopping and they go for a walk. In <laughs> no, the and park they go and, on demonstrations, and yeah. that's why they. Yeah. I mean, they blog about their own activities, their own you know uh, activist mm. activities offline. That's what mm. they blog about most of mm. the time. They don't mm. just blog uh, while not being uh, active on the streets. Yeah. Most of the time, that's the case, and so most of the time, whenever somebody is out in a demonstration, that's when you know the police will get them, and then they will get them for something else other than so the the offense is, is rarely for a blog, although that has also happened in the Arab world, but but very um, very few times has that happened. The, okay. the more common thing to happen is for bloggers to be targeted while doing something else, and just given any pre-approved uh, offense and you know suddenly they're on trial and they're given a sentence of that many years or they just remain in prison for month and month pending investigation uh, and you know it's a, it's a sort of a, a an, would it not be an true intimidation to say, technique for would it not be true else? to say though on balance based on your experience in Egypt in particular that we have these thoroughly unsatisfactory examples of the targeting of people once they move from online to offline. This is all very unsatisfactory, but it has to be seen in the overall picture where the internet, broadly speaking, has raised the volume of conversation, the range of conversation, in an overwhelmingly powerful way. Of course, and there has been a lot of talk, and this is one of my actually main uh, main areas that I've that I've written about of, of you know the role of social media during the Arab Spring, particularly in Egypt. There, there has mm. been a lot of talk about that, and it, it's been a very active um, arena. Perhaps it's been exaggerated the role of the internet too. Well, it's not an internet revolution. Let's say you know, no. it's a people's okay. revolution, okay. but it's it's been much facilitated and assisted by the internet, and okay. it, it's helped a great deal in organizing Thank and in that. bringing about um, you know a lot of uh, mm. a lot of knowledge because otherwise the mainstream media doesn't really tell you what's happening on the Let's street. Let's bring Walid back in then we'll go to the wider world. I, I, I actually like the fact that she mentioned it's not an internet revolution. I mean yeah. it's not a Twitter revolution, it's not a Facebook revolution. And I'd like to mention here a quote if it's, a, if, if it's another mm. competition then whoever would guess is <laughs> gets an award. Yeah. We es overestimated the robustness of some of the authoritarian regimes that's the Arab authoritarian regimes, and underestimated demands for a better life, measured partly in human rights terms. Do you know who said it? There's another lunch for somebody no, here. Eric, it's Eric Goldstein of Human Rights Watch. Very good. So the idea here is that we have basic needs as Arabs, as human beings. Mm -hmm. One of them is freedom. And if we do not understand the very fact that the desire, the motivation stems from that, regardless of the technology that's introduced, it's not going to make any difference. Here I, I would connect to the point of uh, what Russia has been mentioning is that although uh, anonymity and privacy and issues of that nature are crucial, I mean, what is the real problem is the fear of being prosecuted. Yeah. So even if you had the imp impression, of, if you were not surveilled, uh, you and you have the illusion of being surveilled, cy like the cyber pan. pan, pan, pan Okay, good, yes. So, I mean, a feeling of being surveilled. In, so that is the same result. It is. It is. It's numbing and it's debilitating. Um, Isabel and Christian, w w what have we got going on out there? Uh, we can see some things on the screen, but there's perhaps other things you want to share with us? Um, uh, what Renata said about uh, surveillance as pollution really resonates on the internet, yep. I can say, and especially this, uh, this is something that we've done together, governments and companies and people making money of it and regular citizens uh, facilitating it. And I have a question to Guy Berger, uh, uh, um, uh, kind of in that, in that area, that given that UN is primarily represented by governments, is this really the right venue to address issues related to privacy, considering that you know governments and companies are so involved together in this? That's a good question for Guy. You want me to respond now? Please. Well, uh, absolutely. I think uh, we, we, we're at a stage of the world ever since WISIS that uh, you know, governments are not governance. 
and governance uh, is much wider, it includes corporations, civil society, and you know, if you leave it up to any one actor to try and do what they should be doing, it, it ain't going to work. It's like the pollution model, to, be, to use that metaphor. And I think that, um, of course, governments have the pr primary responsibility because they're representatives of, of, or they should be representatives of their populations, but um, governments move in response to what societies tell them to do. Uh, you see or not, as the case may be. <laughs> or, or not, but ultimately, uh, you know, governments don't survive if they don't align in some way with what a society wants them to do, as you saw well, in the Arab broadly world. Broadly speaking, you're right. And, and, and so I want to say that mm. I think that there is a, a lot of interface also for other uh, actors to interface with, with governments. Mm. To, so the UN system is not a, a completely impermeable system. Unfortunately, it sort of tends to, it's tended to be in a bubble, and so some of the quotes I read, people haven't heard of them. But people should pay attention to this is being done in your name, and you should take it back home and say to your governments, we believe that you have committed to this at the UN, so where's the action back at home? Yep. Uh, I mean, this, this seems to me a, a really important role for other people to make sure governments do what they should be I doing. I think the civilians, the citizens of many countries would be rather surprised to learn what their ambassadors to the UN had signed up. And they probably are not all that willing to share it sometimes, these ambassadors. I think there was a question somewhere over the, this side, I was told, um, beyond my field of vision. No, actually, no. it's not a question okay. because you, you ask about the, the Arabic experience and I raise my yes. hand. Mm. Uh, but I, I just want to mention that uh, it's... Uh, it's good to highlight that the internet, the positive side of the internet, that it's create um, a kind of a new resistance. I'm talking about uh, the experience in Palestine. Right. Uh, that there is a resistance uh, uh, in the internet used in this way. That's like uh, exposure uh, of uh, what the, the Israeli occupation do and uh, discuss it widely uh, and making campaigns, etc. So this is what I want to share, that it's, it's, there is a new model created a new model of resistance created by the internet. Okay, yeah. thank you for that observation. I, I want to uh, now continue the conversation as a kind of dialogue between the, 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 the pursuit of global norms and ideals and how to implement them and the situation on the ground in a bit more detail. So I'm going to ask Agnes to talk about the former um, and then... Uh, Pirong Rong to talk about the latter coming as she does from the distinct uh, context of Thailand. So Agnes, to you first. Yeah, I, um, I'll make um, two quick points for this first round of um, comments. Um, the first one is uh, very much going to pick up on uh, what we've heard so far. But I think I would like to add a little bit more layer of uh, complexity in our discussion on the undermining of privacy online. Um, I th historical evidence and uh, work that has been done on the issue tend to show that there are three forces at play. And we ought to really concentrate on them all together, maybe rather than pick one. Um, the first one is security. And I think um, to focus on surveillance is kind of um, forgetting where it's coming from. And the uh, security um, ideology that has permeated every aspect of our life since 9-11 uh, is what has made surveillance possible in people's consciousness. To focus on surveillance without going back into its ideological basis, I think is not going to work. Um, I have written a year and a half ago about security as an algorithm that is basically infiltrating almost all formulas regarding interaction between individuals, between individual and the state. So that's one thing I would like to park there as a security. The second is um, a capitalist dynamic, which is always looking for profit and the commercial interest. So we're talking about, we've talked a lot about um, the role of um, Facebook, Google, Verizon, AT&T, and so on. They are names. What is driving that is the search for new markets and the search for profit. We have entered a new uh, industrial revolution. We're not dealing with coal, 
C-O-A-L, not sure I pronounce it well. It's not Fordism, it's an information society. And what it means is that information is what is bringing profit. Um, and that is a dynamic which I think is going to be extremely difficult to challenge because it, you know, it, it's far beyond our historical period. It's about the essence of the economy, economic system we live in, which is the search for profit. And in our current era, that search is very much driven by who has access to information, who controls it, who uses it, and so on and so forth. And the third dynamic, which you hinted to a bit, uh, but which I don't think we've elaborated enough so far, is individual behavior. This is also part of what has undermined privacy. You know? And of course, when we talk about it in between ourselves or with our kids, we're always saying, be careful, um, don't put everything online, blah, blah, blah. Um, we, we have created a monster with, uh, with internet, as it has been uh, so far uh, understood by particularly the younger generations, but also probably the older one. We cannot forget individual behaviors as one of the key dynamics that has also facilitated um, the, the, the undermining of privacy. Uh, that's the three forces this is, this is I would a very, like to very put important point. on, on, very, on the table. Three very important points. I want to take you up on the last of them. When you talk about individual behaviour, you're talking, I suppose, about what would be regarded from points of view of decency as misbehaviour, that uh, individuals have engaged in activity that has been morally questionable. You said, we've created a monster. Is it we, the, is it we, the netizens, who've created the, monist, the monster, or is it... Uh, is it the corporations, or are we both, are we both in a pact? Okay, I, I'm, I'm trying, trying, trying to simplify as much as possible to go back to uh, mm. the point that was made. Um, the forces behind internet, the philosophy behind internet, is that of an open space governed by the users. Yep. That's what that's what happened initially, uh, and that's what permitted people to do all those things that they have done and to, for many, find self-realization through internet, you know, exploring, testing, doing all kinds of things. Um, that was also driven by a complete, near complete, absence of legal and and re laws and regulations. That was part of the internet ethos. Mm. And it has worked to a certain extent to the benefits of everybody. I think we probably made a major tactical mistake, but then again, you know, it's part of who was driving the internet. So it's not a tactical mistake, it was just a dynamic. But we've created a monster in the sense that the absence of legal and regulatory framework to guide individual behaviors has also been now misused by a large number of corporations and any kind of um, uh, economic actors involved in the uh, use, retention, detention, uh, misuse of information. Mm. Okay? Um, the, um, this, this is a dynamic. So the, the I will not call that misbehavior at all. I will call individual behaved in the way that they felt internet was giving them the authorization to behave. Um, in the absence, and you know, I'm maybe um, unlike some of my colleagues or maybe younger generation, I kind of believe that actually laws and regulation can work to our benefit. Uh, but in, 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 in the absence of laws and regulations, there has been no guidance. Uh, there has been, it has been used very profitably for us in, in, in uh, freedom of association, in protest movement and so on, but it has also very much been uh, m misused, misguided uh, by, by many, including ourselves, in the way we use internet, in the way we put our uh, private life on display for a number of actors to use for their economic interest, for their political interest, for their historical interest. So it, um, I believe that we have now reached a critical juncture juncture, and I will stop just there to put the critical junctures because they open the responses maybe. One is 
uh, as I mentioned, the legal and, and regulatory framework. I don't think we can proceed anymore with just you know, asking for better technology, counter technology. That will happen anyway. We really, as activists, need to really insist on a legal and regulatory framework that is going to protect us. I think that's one, one critical jun junction. The second is going to be um, how the individual is going to be located within that uh, digital environment and the institutional ecology that we are looking at at the moment. You have a clear collusion and complicity between the meta, mega corporations and the state. And I can give plenty of evidence of that. What about the third actor, who is the individual? You know, how are we going to bring him back or her back into that ecology and, and, and that institutional framework? Agnes, thank you for those points uh, powerfully made. Is it the consensus of this room that we have created a monster and we are at this critical juncture? Is there any counter view to that? Is there any view which has a different shade of emphasis or are you all signing up to the position put out by Agnes that here is a monster created in complicity with the large corporations and to some extent governments that is at a critical juncture and that's where regulation comes in. There are no dissenters from that. I don't want too much groupthink, so I hope someone will speak up and... Uh, <laughs> Guy. Uh, yeah, well, I, I'm, I'm not uh, so pessimistic. I think one should look at the opportunities as well as the problems, but I also think that um, before one looks at regulation and, and law, one should look at self-regulation, uh, which in the traditional media space has been a very important question. And I know uh, my colleague Agnes would probably say self-regulation is a recipe for privatised censorship and no accountability. Yeah. But we don't make that argument vis-à-vis mm -hmm. -vis the traditional media. Okay. Traditional media, we accept self-regulatory systems, uh, peer review, professional mechanisms for a certain amount of redress and ethical... But Guy, online media is self-regulated, you know? It, I don't think the problem is with online media. I, I, I believe that the self-regulation as far as Facebook uh, or Google are concerned has meant uh, a, a drive for so-called terms and conditions. I would invite you all to uh, actually watch that documentary called uh, Terms and Conditions. And those terms and conditions have, you know, uh, have not played to, to the, um, you know, have acted as censorship in complete secrecy because while those actors are very keen and willing to tell us what is the government asking them to, uh, to open up, they certainly are not telling us what they themselves have censored. Uh, okay. That are data that we are not uh, pervy for. All right, of. Renata. So quickly, I have the pleasure and the privilege to uh, work uh, together with the creator of the web. In this web, we want initiative, and this is just about this. It's uh, just about looking that we are at, a, at, at this crossroads, at this critical moment, and uh, when countries, citizens are realizing that they need more structure and uh, some guideline uh, to uh, define what is the internet that they want in their countries, mm -hmm. what is the frame, the legal, legally binding frame that they would like to implement in their countries. We have the great example with Brazil and the Marco Civil process, and we have uh, in, uh, in the Philippines the Magna Carta of the internet and other uh, examples of not self-regulation, because self-regulation is usually made by few handle of actors who hold the economic and political power, but for, by a diverse set of actors that are starting to, uh, to engage in these political processes. Okay. And quickly, young people, they are not as disengaged and uh, not as clueless and not uh, unaware as many will think, especially in the Global South. We have seen many, many examples of people perfectly understanding how local politics and global politics matter for the things that they, that they do online. Okay. Um, Very good. I want to bring the, gentleman, bring the gentleman in over here who has raised his hand. Thank you so much. My name is Jeff. I'm from Uganda. The issue we really tend to discuss here seems to be really presenting um, uh, diverse uh, views, given the fact that actually where I'm coming from, from East Africa, it's going to be a challenge really to break privacy and... Uh, the protection because when you look at uh, in our regime countries that are coming from they seem to be really a, 
a closed relationship between privacy and fighting terrorism. And all the laws that we have seem to be really bent mm -hmm. on that. Mm -hmm. yeah. So even when you argue that um, I think I deserve a right to privacy online, the government will say we are trying to fight terrorism. In Uganda for the last five years, we've had like five policies, but they are all really intending really to control mm -hmm. what really is expressed online, not really seem to be really promoting the sector. So I think the happy task that we have is how do we uh, separate the two Thank you. Thank you very much for that comment. I want to, um, we've had a, 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 a very interesting uh, little encounter with the Arab world earlier on, courtesy of Walid and our colleagues uh, here. I think now we should turn to um, the Southeast Asian context and Thailand in particular. Um, and it's great that uh, Pruren Rong is here to talk a little bit about this because I know that uh, the way in which some of these concepts that are used in the international discourse mm -hmm. are seen in a different light and refracted in different ways in the Thai context in particular. And I think you've got a few thoughts to share with us about that. Yes, if you don't mind, I'd like to tap from um, Agnes' um, metaphor of, mm. the, of the monster. Actually, to me, um, we've, al we've always had a demon in, 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 in the Thai state or in the Southeast Asian, mm. many of the Southeast Asian states, um, and that means surveillance. We always have a demon, but then the demon has been um, strengthened by the new technology into a monster. And to me, surveillance has preceded digitization, has preceded the internet. It yep. has been a much longer existing practice than privacy, which to me, I mean, privacy, we don't even have a word for privacy in Thai. We transliterate it, you know, as um, the condition of being private. And I think that goes um, for a lot of countries in Southeast Asia and, and probably in, in Africa as well. That, that I've, I've talked to a few African uh, friends and, and I found that to be true. But um, so to me, privacy is more uh, a product of globalization. And we don't really see a discourse for privacy, a policy discourse for privacy until after like 1995 when there is a directive, an EU directive on transborder data flow. And that became sort of a policy discourse for all countries to converge across this. And we didn't see a legislation on privacy in the South before that. But then after that, you began to see this unfold. Mm. Okay. So coming from Thailand, um, other than the fact that we are steep with coups, we've had 17 coups. The last one, staged last week, was at 18. And uh, we had um, a turn from the absolute monarchy to constitutional monarchy in 1932. So in that 80 years, we have had 17 or oh, 18 coups to date. But the fact that you probably don't know is that we also a very um, qualified surveillance state. In the ancient time, um, the Thai state has um, administered mass surveillance by registration rules, coupled with ta tattooing the risk of all commoners with code. So all commoners would be coded with a certain um, symbols, and then you have to report to a certain um, noble for, to, to extract the labor and so on and so forth. And then after the modern period, you have census, you have um, registration role or what we call um, civil registration and citizen ID. And on the security side, we have always been a buffer state between the free world and the communist world. And we have never been colonized, so we have been a buffer state before that between colonization and non-colonization and, and, non and imperialism. So with that security state status, uh, we've had the first um, citizen ID card since the 1940s. Right. Okay, the, the, the first one, I, I got pictures to show, but um, mm. I'll just go through this a mm. bit. Uh, 1943 was first, and then 1963 is the second, and that's after the Cold War. And in 1988, that's when computerization began. We had the first computerization of the so-called civil registration database in 1981, way before anybody else. And we have another one, uh, a new uh, ID again in 1996. And the latest one launched in 2005 is a microchip card capable of storing all kinds of information from your names, your parents' name, um, your 
uh, blood type, your medical conditions, um, fingerprints, anything, any biometrics data, and, and also social security and social welfare and so mm -hmm. forth. Um, for that matter, um, surveillance has really rendered um, the Thai citizen very transparent. We were talking about transparency yes. and accountability, but in this sense, the Thai state has rendered the citizens transparent, traceable, and liable. Okay, it's very easy for um, law enforcers to go after criminals. I mean, and we often wonder that in such an inefficient world that we live in in Thailand, you know, why do police can go after the criminals and get them the next day? It's because we ha they have the backup this, of this long existed surveillance yeah. system. You can just, by, the, by a touch of the keystroke, you can find out where they are and, and who are their relatives and you know, all, all the key information. I know the Constitution has been suspended now, but what yes. does the Constitution say about individual rights well, as there, far as Well, there is a clause on, on individual privacy, but it tends Freedom to focus... Freedom of association, too? Mm, that, too, yeah. But it tends to focus more on the physical dimension of privacy yeah. rather, than, rather than the informational dimension yeah. of privacy. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Renata? I would like to, uh, to point out, it's not working, but... Uh, it is, we yeah? can hear you. Yeah. Yep. yeah, so I would like to point out uh, something very important that you mentioned, and is um, identification and the abuse in the, during the abusive regimes. Like, there are many uh, Latin Americans in the audience, and uh, we were like one of the, like uh, we have one of the few very concrete examples of the harm of the violation of privacy uh, through electronic surveillance and these huge databases of uh, citizens in the genocide in Guatemala, with all the disappeared in the uh, dictatorship in Argentina, in El Salvador, in Uruguay. So it is it's very tangible and it's very recent. And I invite everyone to look at those examples. But what I wanted to say is that imagine, just imagine those dictatorships with the technologies that we have today, mm -hmm. with this kind of idea, yeah. mm -hmm. the possibility to crush these centers and to disappear them and to disappear even their, their records forever is very there, it's very tangible and it's very dangerous. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, uh, uh, and it's this um, uh, public private partnership with this. Uh, uh, my friend Jacob Applebaum uh, usually refers to this as uh, the Facebook as the Stasi book because it plays similar role if you're in a context like if you are an activist in Mexico or if you are a journalist in Honduras or if you are in this di very difficult uh, uh, political context the context in the Middle East, it offers, it, it, it is not, it's a direct threat to democracy because it, it can disappear minorities. It right. can lead to genocides, okay. actually. Let us uh, solicit questions, uh, invite criticisms, or observations, comments. Please join the conversation. Who would like to uh, put their hand up and uh, um, make a contribution? Sir. Uh, thank you. Um, I would like to subscribe completely to what Agnes said earlier. Uh, you know, it's the uh, the idea that we need to go back to the roots of the problem, and the idea also that we are at a, at a historic juncture. Uh, I work for Global Voices Advocacy, and uh, I have the privilege of being at, at the crossroads of many worlds, technological, you know, activists, uh, and uh, entrepreneurs, mm. etc. And uh, we we really feel that there is a as Renata said earlier, there is a realization among, um, you know, the, those internet users that are, that are more affected, uh, that this battle is eminently political, and it's no longer enough to hide behind a computer monitor and just uh, say that this shouldn't shouldn't be happening. But people are, as uh, as far as I can see, people are more and more uh, getting. Um, um, becoming more and more visible. And uh, we are seeing this across the MENA region. I come from Morocco. Right. And there are many of those activists who used to hide behind anonymity uh, and uh, pseudonyms who are now registering NGOs and advocacy groups and uh, engaging with governments and trying to advocate and articulate a powerful discourse and a powerful argument 
to explain why privacy matters. Because we've been clueless in re recent years uh, in responding to those, those very powerful arguments from the other side. It, it, and the other side is not, is not always the government. It could be non-state actors like religious groups, um, you know, uh, asking you to disclose everything because you may be a, an atheist, for example, or, I mean, many kind of those yep. uh, arguments. And most of the time we are clueless. I think we need to have, as activists, as, um, you know, uh, proponents of uh, privacy for the weak and transparency for the powerful, uh, we need to have an introspective okay. uh, look into our own philosophy and try to articulate powerful arguments, explain why privacy is not only about hiding something, but it's about freedom of expression. Very good, thank you. Piran Rong, you wanted to come here. Yeah, I, uh, I just want to um, continue on to, to that cultural aspect of it. Because of the, um, just the dominance of surveillance in, in the country and, and the region that I'm from, um, um, certain values that are associated with privacy could not really emerge, and we see incidents in in like in the um, uh, period pre um, be, uh, before the coup. We see a lot of polarization in our country between you know the red shirt and the yellow shirt politics, and we see a phenomenon of what we call, of what I call, participatory surveillance, or uh, some people would call it a cyber witch hunt, in which. Just a civilian, another civilian would be um, exposing all kinds of personal information about another person from a different political ideology and create like a page called social sanction on people who do not support the royal family. Right. And, and that is a big ideology in Thailand to be royalist or not. And people, other people would come in, you know, and, and, and it would be like cyber lynching. And it goes from uh, online to offline. There was a case of an employee of a um, DHL company who posted something on Facebook that could be deemed as less majeste. Less majeste means defaming yes. the royal family. And this person was fired, was fired from DHL, which is actually, I think, is a German company. And then there is another um, girl who was denied a place in a university admission system, uh, a nationwide university admission system, three times to three by three different universities because of the thing that she put on Facebook. But somebody captured it and put everything, all her, all her personal details on, on a page on Facebook. Mm. And this is done by another civilian. The government has nothing to do with it. The gentleman there, and then the gentleman behind him, both gentlemen wearing glasses. Do we have, uh, I'll come to the, the digital world in a moment. Let's stay with the uh, present company for the moment. Uh, yeah, I just uh, want to say, I, I don't know if in reality that there is more now, or perhaps in the near future, more violations of people's rights because of the internet and because people are more connected. Because, yes, it, people have been surveyed, Repressive governments have been, and non-repressive governments have, or so-called democratic governments have been surveilling people for decades in different ways, either through their neighbors, their, uh, through the telephone, through mobile phones, through the internet now. And the, the, the actual violations in the real world come partly from that, but partly from other things. And I think it's interesting what, what we've heard about the, the, you know, the cyber bullying, for example, which is a... Uh, a consequence of the increased space for expression online publicly and semi-publicly on places like Facebook, for example. Uh, but it is, it's the dilemma that's always been there in terms of regulating freedom of expression, to what extent, what's, what's allowed and what's not. But I think just the, the so sometimes if you would just jump into the conclusion that, that because the internet is so open, there is this expect, expectation, we have the expectation of privacy, but beyond the, you know, privacy itself, the other human rights violations are not necessarily uh, that obvious. All right. Uh, would anybody like to respond to that, concur or contend with that particular argument? Agnes? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, first, um, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure we can, and I don't think any of us have actually argued that there is more violation now because of internet at all. Um, you know, historically speaking, we are in, uh, in an era where 
Uh, there are less people being tortured and there are less people dying of hunger than 50 or 100 years ago and, and so on and so forth. So that's uh, that just to be, uh, to be very clear. Um, the, the violation of the right to privacy is real uh, and it is a violation of an international universal human rights. It is not something as tangible as not to be tortured and I think that's part of the problem that uh, because it doesn't necessarily uh, reverberate or resonate in people's mind uh, in terms of who they are as human, um, it's probably more difficult to raise awareness and to build strategies of action. And that to me is uh, clearly indicating one area of intervention on the part of civil society and uh, individual like, like, like us, is, which is awareness raising and education. I think it cannot be understated. We need to really um, raise far greater awareness about what privacy means, uh, including online privacy for our humanity. And, okay. and do that in a far more effective fashion than we have done so far. Okay. Uh, we need to, um, as civil society cyber rights activists, we need to question the meaning of open internet in an environment that is and will be dominated by um, global corporations, big corporations, international corporations search for profit. Okay. What, you know, in, in an industrialized system that is dominated, driven by information. And I, I don't think we have done enough of that yet. All right, Agnes, let me, um, time is, is pressing. The gentleman at the back and then we'll go to our digital curators for the final comment. Sir. Uh, thank you. I'm Christian Christensen from Stockholm University. I just, it's more of a comment than this. Last year's uh, Stockholm Internet Forum, one of the big issues was the sale of surveillance hardware and software mm -hmm. as a result of... Mm -hmm. Stories about Nokia and Ericsson and Telios and Era. And that was been kind of lost, I think, in this meeting that we've had this time, that we've had new agendas and new things. And I think it's just one thing maybe that's worth considering is what we can do, those of us who live in this part of the world, um, uh, in terms of putting pressures on governments and corporations. And one thing that crossed my mind is, of course, one of the justifications for the sale of those was the, that these were benign technologies that were components of most cellular sales. In other words, they were not extraordinary. Well, if that's the case, then I think there should be open transparency about what gets sold and to whom and to what purposes they can be used. That's one thing. Because uh, if they are benign, there's no reason not to tell us who they're selling it to and why. And the second one is if, if they are used for military purposes, maybe we can classify these things we do as we do arms sales. If technology is being used for the purposes of military use or police use, and if we sell hardware in terms of arms in that way openly, and we classify them as such, then I guess one thing also that is possible is to place pressures on governments to classify surveillance technologies in those ways. These All are right. legitimate businesses that are s selling uh, material in other forms, and we accept that as a legal transaction. So why not do the same thing with surveillance? Renata, briefly. And uh, connecting to that, maybe sh we should frame these technologies, if they are framed as uh, arms, uh, we should frame it in the arm reduction uh, approach. What does so. the um, virtual world say about our discussion so far? Um, uh, people are very engaged, uh, I have to say. Uh, one question that keeps coming up is uh, also in regards to discussion we had yesterday is the question of whether there are technical or political solutions to this or some sort of balance. Because people talk about, uh, someone mentioned the Tor project, for example, um, and how and which solutions, technical or, pol or political? It's a great question. Agnes has raised her pen, so yes. she's got she's got both technical and political solutions. Yeah, I, I, yeah. Um, I mean, I, I, uh, first of all, I don't think we can oppose them. Uh, in I, my um, instinct and analysis will tend to show that we cannot overemphasize a technological solution simply because. Um, it's, it's getting to be a game of mouse and cat. And we need to, f to, to set up some rules on how that game is going to take place. Okay. This being said, um, in terms of the technological solution, of course we need to be more aware and we need to use encryption and so on and so forth. My, my feeling is that we need to encourage competition. I mean, one of the big problems at the moment is that basically 
um, the, the internet world, uh, the platforms, the are, are dominated by a very few number of actors. Oh, understood. And there are some smaller actors that we as activists have probably very much neglected. Alternative to Google, for instance. Alternative to Facebook. It, this is about personal behavior. It's about our, you know, but collectively it can have an impact on that ecology. Um, Guy and Walid briefly, and then we must close. So briefly, I think there's also an educational solution, part of these solutions. And uh, there's, a, there's a group uh, called the Global Alliance for Partnerships in Media and Information Literacy, which is actually meeting in Paris today. Mm. They're producing what they call an, an augmented media and information literacy, which uh, deals with the knowledge, skills, and critical attitudes that are needed to access, uh, interact with, create, innovate with this new environment. Good. And this is something that can go into schools in, in, in curricula. Yep. So it, it can be quite a practical thing. And very quickly, lastly, as people may have heard, UNESCO is doing a big study on all these things. It's a participative, consultative study, particularly on how to deal with the impact of limited uh, privacy and what solutions there are. So please visit the UNESCO website, Internet Study, and give us your, your, your knowledge, your input, your, your opinions. Very good. Thank Walid? Uh, in, in the last six years, I've been working on my doctoral, and finally I'll be defending next week, so hopefully it goes <laughs> fine. Uh, one of the main findings that I've come to is that in the Arab world, there appears to be a growing tendency to look into the Internet as one uh, uh, one method of extra uh, technological li technology liberation tools. It's not necessarily all the tools or all the solution, but one of them. And one key aspect that I got to learn is that don't repeat the north to south the paradigm or the connection yeah. of looking down on those countries on the internet. Make sure that you know that there are entrepreneurs, there are qualified people in the south, there are activists that are having the competence and capacity to work on their own and col in collaboration. And that's why I salute the uh, Cyber Stewards Program, which is a global program by the Citizen Lab, to enable this communication between those in the south with those in the north in an equal footing. Okay, someone who shall remain nameless has just made a sign to me that indicates the severance of the head from the torso <laughs> if I let it get on. And since I'm not willing to entertain that, at least until after lunch, I will have to uh, conclude things now. Uh, I did say at the beginning that this was a huge topic and we could talk about it for the rest of the day. But I hope you agree also that the panel have made an important contribution to it and you'll join me in thanking them. Thank you.